tonight we're going to start a new series on uh, going through John 13 through 17. This is sometimes called the Farewell Discourse um, in the Gospel of John, and it's five chapters that are primarily just Jesus's own words and his own teaching, and it's a really um, just, just some of the most memorable things Jesus ever said are in, are are here, and so uh, I want us to spend one, spend one chapter a week just reflecting on this really important uh, text and what it means for our discipleship as we, again, are preparing ourselves for the celebration of Easter uh, in, in just a little over a month. So what I want to do now is, um, I think what I probably will do as we go through this passage today, I'll, I do want to read the whole chapter eventually, but I think I'll probably will uh, read each part as it comes along. Um, so that we're not just having one long, larger block of, of reading. So um, I want you to think about saying goodbye to somebody who you love. And of course, again, given the loss that we've experienced recently in our community, we, we, we think of those who might, we might say goodbye to because of death, but even just a close friend who uh, is going away for a long time and you maybe aren't sure if you'll ever see that person again uh, this side of heaven. I remember uh, when I graduated from seminary, uh, I was, I'd been in classes with the same people for three and a half years. And, you know, it, some of them were going as, as soon as we graduated, some of them were shipping off to different places. I had a friend moving out of state to South Carolina. One of my closest friends through seminary was from England and he was returning home uh, soon. And so, uh, you know, the farewell parties were fun. They were filled with laughter. They were filled with stories and memories but they also were filled with tears. Um, you know, some, you feel the sorrow of this person who's meant so much to you and now you're not sure when you'll see him again. Um, they're tears of joy, thanking God for all the time that you had together. And of course, they're uh, moments filled with prayer. But we remember those moments, right? We, we remember those last words that we sh share with the people who we love and again, who we hope to see again. Well, in, in John 13 through 17, Jesus, we're told from the very beginning, he is preparing for his imminent crucifixion. Uh, he knows that his time is drawing near, and so he spends this night preparing his disciples for that departure. He spends it helping them get ready for whenever he's not going to be with them in person anymore. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's Thursday night, uh, whenever they're about to share the Passover feast together, and it says in John 13, verse 1, When Jesus knew his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And so he spends five chapters demonstrating in his actions what they should be doing, giving them explicit teaching, and even praying for them uh, before God. Uh, again, this is sometimes called the farewell discourse. We're, we're going to call it lessons from the upper room. And uh, we'll learn about discipleship, the person and work of Jesus Christ, the sending and ministry of the Holy Spirit, uh, the certainty of suffering and sorrow for those who follow Jesus, and the necessity of, un of unity uh, in the church. And, and most of all, the love that Jesus has for us and for his disciples. Um, so uh, again, there's several stunning vignettes, and he, in this chapter alone, he gives us examples he gives us negative examples, uh, and he gives us direct teaching. So the first thing I want us to do is to read John 13, verses 1 through 10. So if you have your Bible, leave it open. We're going to be going to it again and again. Uh, but John 13, 1 to 10, this is what Jesus says. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he'd come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. He then poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, 
you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. When he washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and so uh, I am. You're right, for so I am. If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate his bread, ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. I want you to imagine for just a second being at a banquet and you are privileged to have a seat at the table with the guest of honor, or maybe it's the speaker who everyone came to hear that night. And that person walks away from the table. Maybe you think they've gone to the restroom, but when they come back, they're dressed in their work clothes. Uh, they uh, have on just an undershirt and uh, they've got some blue jeans on and they have a basin with them and uh, they start to clean everyone's feet. You would be shocked and everyone in attendance would be shocked to see the guest of honor on their hands and knees uh, cleaning one another's feet. It probably would be very awkward, right? Because you would know you're not worthy to receive this. You should be in the opposite position. Well, this is what the setting would have been like for Jesus and his disciples on that night. Uh, it says that he stripped off his outer garment. And he probably would have just had a loincloth or something uh, to cover uh, um, uh, to cover his waist uh, while he was cleaning. And, and this was a task, cleaning one another's feet was a task that was necessary, but very lowly. Um, the master of the house would potentially do this for his guests or one of his servants, or maybe the lowest member in the household, maybe one of his children would do this task. Uh, because it was not glamorous. Uh, washing one another's feet meant you needed to wash off all the caked up. You know, imagine this is a society where only people wear sandals. Uh, I wear sandals a little bit in the summer and my feet get pretty stinky after just a, you know a day of it. Uh, this is there every single day wearing leather sandals or maybe no sandals at all. And so their feet are caked with dirt, they're smelly, they're grimy. And so this was a very practical service. Uh, it was an act of hospitality. And Jesus does this to the disciples. Simon's Peter, Simon Peter's reaction is not that surprising. Lord, you do this to me? And Jesus says, yes, I'm going to do it to you. And, Jesus, and then Peter says, you will never wash my feet. I'm never going to let you stoop to that level of humility. But what does Jesus say? If I don't wash your feet, you have no share with me. It's very striking. And Peter realizes, okay, not only my feet, you can wash my whole body because I need whatever cleansing you provide. I think this is a reminder to us of the humility that's required to come unto Jesus. All right? There are a lot of reasons that someone might not believe uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, why they might be hesitant to be baptized or to join a church, but part of it is, is that we have to come to grips with the fact that we cannot save ourselves. Indeed, we can't cleanse ourselves. We have to come unto Jesus for this. It requires humility. We have to set our pride away. And indeed, beyond that, we have to imitate Jesus. Jesus is very clear here, right? You call me teacher and Lord, and so I am. And therefore, if I, your teacher and Lord, if I would deign, if I would stoop to wash your feet, you also must wash one another's feet. Uh, there are some Christian churches and denominations who have made this another ordinance, right? So you churches do baptism, they do the Lord's Supper, and they wash 
one another's feet. I know of some Pentecostal denominations that do this. If you've ever heard of the, the Grace Brethren, they're uh, a bigger denomination around Ohio. They do it. Free Will Baptists do it. Maybe we need to have McKenna over here and we can ask her about the history of this. But I think, and this is how most Protestants and most Christians have interpreted this, that it's a reference to rendering practical, lowly service to one another. Um, it's you, you all know my favorite passage in the Bible is Philippians 2, 1 through 11, uh, where we have this, you know, picture of Jesus, uh, um, you know, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be taken advantage of, but rather he humbled himself and was born, uh, he didn't count equality with God as something to be taken advantage of, but was born in the likeness of man and being found in human form. He humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, right? It's the downward mobility that we see in Jesus' own person that he calls us to as Christians. And here it's, again, commanded in the very most practical ways of service. And so I think as we reflect upon this, we have to ask, do we think that there is any task, and I mean any task, that is too low for us to do as people? Right, we live in a modern, middle-class society, most of us, and we probably think there are certain tasks we don't want to do. Somebody does those things, and we might think, well, this is, you know, not me, right? I'm, 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 I have made too much money. I am too, uh, too high in society. I'm not doing that. But remember, Jesus stooped to wash our feet, and I, I really do think this means that there's no level of service that is too low for us as Christians, and we, as Christians, should be marked out by our uh, loving and following Jesus in this way uh, and representing him in this way. So we have this image of discipleship, right? The the towel and basin, which is so powerful as we're called to serve one another uh, in, in very radical ways. He, Jesus calls his disciples to this. And we actually, in this chapter, we have two images of failed discipleship. And I want to read those. One of them, I'm actually going to fast forward to the end of the chapter, verse 36 through 38. It says, Simon Peter says, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can, I, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you've denied me three times. But being a disciple of Jesus means that we do follow Jesus. That's what Peter wants us to do, and that we love Jesus. And, uh, but sometimes that call, we think it's easier than it is. I think Peter, again, Peter's been with Jesus three years. He knows that following Jesus is not a bed of roses. He's heard the call from Jesus to take up your cross daily and follow me. But he still is a bit overconfident in his ability to perform as a disciple and to walk in the path of Jesus. And it's, it's a combination, I think, of pride on the one hand, of having too high of an estimation of himself, and ignorance, on the other hand, of what Jesus is about to go through. Right? Jesus has kind of dropped hints here and there to his disciples that there's a day coming where he's going to suffer and die, but they never quite get it until it happens. And so, uh, you know, Peter thinks that he's ready to lay his down life, his life down for Jesus, but whenever he gets to the moment and during Jesus' trial, he denies Jesus three times. So we have one failure on this end of, I, I think this will be easy, and we're overconfident. But on the other hand, there's a jaded skepticism we need to avoid. And here we have the example of Judas Iscariot. I want to look at verses 21 through 30 now. It says, After saying these things, Jesus, this is after you know saying that we should serve one another. Uh, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke spoke. One of the disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon mentioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, and, and most people think this is John who's writing, that disciple leaning back against Jesus said, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I've dipped it. So when he dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he'd taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. 
Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give him something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. And of course, if we read the scene at the Garden of Gethsemane, we know that Jesus, Judas does betray, betray Jesus. And we're not told in all the other Gospels exactly why he did this. I can imagine that he maybe was getting tired of this discipleship. Maybe he was getting jaded about the mission that Jesus was set to accomplish. Uh, but nevertheless, he commits this act of treachery. I don't know if any of you have ever read Dante's Inferno. Um, again, I think a lot of our popular conceptions of hell come from this. And uh, not that it's 100% accurate, but it, I think it is helpful as a work in moral philosophy. And here's why. The people at the center, the lowest level of hell closest to Satan are the people who have committed treachery against friends. So you've got Brutus and Cassius from Julius Caesar, the ones who killed him and betrayed him. But at the very heart is Judas there as the one who betrayed his Lord. And again, I'm not saying that that's exactly how hell is, but I think it's a reminder to us just really how treacherous it is to betray someone who's your friend. Moreover, to betray Jesus. And so, again, the question I would ask us is, if you were to think about your discipleship and which side of the fence you're more likely to fall off on, are you more likely to fall off the side of being a bit overzealous, but maybe naively overzealous about how easy it is to follow Jesus? Or are you on the other side? Maybe you are skeptical about things at times, you have doubts. And again, and I'm not trying to criticize everyone who has doubts here, but you know, you uh, you're more likely to kind of keep yourself at an arm's length and to be the critic who just at the end of the day, you're not going to go along with it. And what I would encourage you to do as you read this chapter is to confess that posture to God, right? Um, know that you might be too quickly buoyed by things and you need God to help you endure. And maybe you realize your heart is just jaded and you need God to give you buoyancy again. You need God to uh, encourage you and to remind you of the zeal and mission that we have for the kingdom. Well, finally, Jesus gives, and, and this is the most explicit teaching in this chapter, that he gives us an old, new commandment. Uh, let's look at verses 31 through 35. So after Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, and now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I've loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Uh, I think this is, again, it's very striking and it's very clear. Uh, what it means for Jesus to be glorified means that uh he is going to be with the Father again in heaven. Uh, John 1.14, that famous verse that says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it says, And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Right? So whenever we see Jesus, we see the glory of God, that, you know, that Shekinah glory cloud that hovered over the temple and the tabernacle manifested in the person of Jesus. And Jesus was sent from the Father to us for us and our salvation. But Jesus is saying, I'm about to return to the Father. right? That glory, the, that glorious purpose that he sent me for, that is about to be fulfilled. But what that means, and Jesus is going to unpack this more in chapter 14 and following. What that means is if I'm going to the Father, it means that I'm leaving you here. Right, where I'm going, you cannot come, right? at least until the, uh, we go to heaven in the resurrection. So here's what he does. He tells them very clearly what they're called to do. I give you this command. Right? In, in, in 1 John, uh, he really plays this up a lot. It's, it, you can tell this has really shaped what, how John conceives of his discipleship. That you love one another. Right? We think of 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And the one who does not love does not know God. So... Uh, Jesus is giving them this command, and 
it's kind of adding upon that example that he gave us earlier that we wash one another's feet. And he, he adds this line, which is just so critical. By this, the world will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. Remember in my sermon on Sunday, I said, uh, sometimes the world gets to look in our window, right? They, they get to look through and they get to see what it's like for us on the inside. They can't see everything that's going on, uh, but they get to see some of our conversations. And the world, when they see Christians, uh, they will know who God is by our love for one another. Conversely, if we don't love one another, we are not able to accurately and truthfully represent who God is. I think it's tragic, tragic especially uh, this can happen on an internal level on the church, right? There, uh, our churches are sometimes so known for conflict that it's a joke and it becomes a trope. And I think that is a true tragedy in every individual instance and the fact that that is something that churches just can be known for at times. Because we should be known as people who love and there's a lot that that entails. It means we have to be a people who are quick to forgive. Has to be we need to be a we need to have a culture where we are looking to care for one another rather than to seek what we can get out of one another. I also think it's tragic whenever Christians publicly like to just have disagreements with one another. Now there is time for public rebuke. There is time for uh, there is a time and a place for. Uh, for those disagreements, but whenever that's what we're known for, whenever that's all that we can show the world, uh, it really does not give Jesus, uh, uh, it doesn't give him a good reputation or a good name. And so we love one another. This is fulfilling the word that Jesus gave to us, but it also helps us to bear witness to the world. And so, again, I will just ask you, who or what is hard for you to love in the church? Who is hard for you to love, right? It's the, uh, I think we are known more for those things that are hard than for the things that are easy. Who's hard for you to love? And how might you, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, by prayer, how might God lead you to love that person? And that might mean that you have a change of feelings in your heart about that person, but it also might mean that God shows you very critical and tangible ways that you can care for that person, right? Love is never just a feeling. It's always moved to an action. So, this is just, I feel like I've covered so much tonight, and this is only the first chapter of these five. So uh, I am looking forward to the rest of uh, studying the rest of these chapters with you all tonight, and um, or not tonight, but in the weeks to come. And I hope that you'll come back. Maybe we'll get some more uh, to join us as well.